detectives welcome to biography life magazine the week of june 25th 1969 one of the big stories the class of 69 the college seniors who continued their protests of vietnam racism and the establishment right through graduation ceremonies among the seniors featured in the article the student president of wellesley college hillary rodham well no need to go to the 25th reunion to find out what happened to her as the most controversial first lady since Eleanor Roosevelt, Hillary Rodham Clinton has been criticized as much as she's been praised. She wields enormous power, more power than her critics feel she's entitled to. And even if she hadn't become first lady, the achievements of Hillary Rodham Clinton would still classify her as one of the most important and influential women in America. When I knew her as a young teenager, she was already a leader. She has been political since she was a tiny tot. People either want to see her as, you know, sort of a combination of Joan of Arc, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, and Betty Crocker, or they want to see her as, uh, you know, uh, the dark angel. Hillary believes that 12-year-olds should have the right to sue their parents. I think in every pore of her body, every cell of her being, there was a purpose in life, and that was to make life better for her other people. She's clearly a very dominant, uh, willful person who is going to have a major impact. I'd rather have that impact out in the open. It's the same kind of an attack that was brought forward when Eleanor Roosevelt was speaking up for civil rights and we really feel strongly that we've got to stand with Hillary Clinton. She was voted most likely to succeed our senior year. I think that was a fairly good pick. She's a very effective advocate for a I point of view. Do. Frankly, I wish she was a conservative and not a liberal. Hillary Rodham Clinton as first lady, as legal rights activist, as policymaker, as wife and mother, she has always inspired powerful reactions. In 1992, she returned to her high school in suburban Illinois. How did a nice Republican girl from Park Ridge <laughs> go wrong? Hillary Diane Rodham, well known for her liberal leanings, did indeed start out as a Republican. She and her two younger brothers, Hugh and Tony, grew up in Park Ridge, Illinois, a bedrock Republican community 20 minutes from downtown Chicago. It was the epitome of the suburban middle class community. And politically conservative, religion was very important, and everybody belonged to a church. Hillary's parents, Hugh Rodham and Dorothy Howell, met when Hugh was a salesman at the Columbia Lace Company in Chicago. Dorothy was a secretary. They married in 1942. The Rodhams' first contribution to the post-war baby boom was Hillary, born October 26, 1947, at Chicago's Edgewater Hospital. Dorothy chose the name Hillary for her 8-pound, eight 8-ounce eight baby because she said it was a strong name, which suited either a boy or a girl. For the first three years, Hillary lived in downtown Chicago, but when her brother Hugh was born in 1950, the Rodham family fled the city for the suburbs. There were trains that would roll through the Park Ridge station, and the men would get off the train with their newspaper under their arm and their hat. Everybody had a hat. Yeah, I don't think you could ride the train unless you had a hat. It was a an almost mythical place to grow up for me. My dad always had a rule. He said five days below zero, we could go skating on the river. And that was a big event. They'd put a big bonfire together and the adults would cook some hot buttered rum and we'd have cocoa with marshmallows and spend a day out on the ice on the river and sledding and skating and it was a lot of fun. Park Ridge was the American dream for Hillary's father who got through Penn State on a football scholarship. Descended from Welsh coal miners, Hugh Rodham was steadfastly conservative in his politics, his affections, and his spending. He was notoriously tight with a dollar. He made you explain why you needed any of this extra money. And the work ethic was very much present in his life. He had worked very hard for what he had, and he believed this was part of growing up, was to learn to appreciate the squeak of a dollar. Nor did he believe in paying what he said... Uh childhood extortion money, which he meant allowances. 
and we never got an allowance. He was, <laughs> I think, the inventor of tough love. Dorothy Rodham encouraged Hillary's passion for learning. She had a very high value on education, and not not, and I'm not talking about possessing a degree. I mean, uh, she had a very, she put a premium on learning. Rick Ricketts had been a friend of Hillary's since fourth grade. He was also her first date. She asked him to a girl's choice dance. We used to, we used to sit on the fence in front of our house and argue about just different anything, we, anything. At Maine South High School, Hillary was involved in everything. She was a student council chair, a national merit finalist, a member of the service society, she even raised money to erase graffiti on a school wall. For a spoof in the school paper, she imagined herself a lawyer and said her ambition was to marry a senator and settle down in Georgetown. She was one of those kids you either loved or hated. She was so good at everything. I think she's always had a, a um, keen sense of who she is and where she's going. And I can remember when we were in junior high, if you wanted to... Uh, be nasty about someone you could say this person was conceited and whatever that meant at that time but it was the ultimate put down and what I think they took as conceit in Hillary was just a sense of confidence. Minister Don Jones's mission was to expose Hillary and his Methodist youth group to the world outside the sheltered security of Park Ridge. The kids called it the University of Life. It was exactly April 15th 1962 Martin Luther King came to Chicago and was to preach at the Sunday Evening Club. It's an institution in Chicago where they invite famous preachers in to preach at Orchestra Hall in Chicago. And so I chose to take the youth group in on the night that Martin Luther King Jr. preached. I had arranged to um, go backstage after the uh, service and I stood next to him and introduced all of the youth as they filed by. And Hillary was 14, 15 and 16 years old in those years and was later then to be shaped by all of the exploding erupting forces of the late 60s. Though the liberal seeds had been planted, Hillary remained a conservative like her father, campaigning as a Goldwater girl in 64. But in the fall of 1965, she ventured east to attend Wellesley College. There those liberal seeds would take root. Don Jones received a letter from Hillary only a month after she got to college saying she had invited a black classmate named Karen Williamson to go to church with her. She said, I just got back from calling my parents. During the course of the conversation, I mentioned the young woman, Karen, and the church. I was so disappointed in my parents' reaction. My attitudes towards many things have changed in just three weeks, and I think I expected Park Ridge to have undergone a similar metamorphosis. My sense is that she came to Wellesley in, in, in absolutely the, the optimum condition from the point of view of coming to another section of her life and another piece of, of, uh, of an educational opportunity with virtually every pore open to be exposed to things she hadn't been exposed to before. And she was learning off campus as well. She was visiting Park Ridge during the 1968 Democratic National Convention. Both our mothers had said, under no circumstances are you to go downtown. So, of course, I got the car, and where did we go? Downtown. And went down and saw this melee, you know, in Grant Park. People throwing things out of the Hilton Hotel. Police acting as we had never seen police acting. So it was, all of a sudden, Vietnam was a different situation for us. And so I think you take that naivete of uh, nothing's going to touch us, and it touched us. As her class at Wellesley prepared to graduate, students in one of Hillary's government classes decided that for the first time ever, a student should speak at graduation. As student body president, 
it was Hillary who was selected. Eleanor Acheson collaborated on the speech. I wrote the speech that she never gave. Instead of sticking with the prepared text, she went off into this now, you know, infamous, extemporaneous commentary. That's because Massachusetts Senator Edward Brooke spoke first, giving a speech that Hillary felt exemplified exactly the kind of unconscious leadership she and her fellow students were rebelling against. He did give graduation speech number, you know, 926. And I think it was more than Hillary could take. And in fact, it was actually a personification of one of the themes that we had written about in the speech, which was completely numb leadership. So Hillary got up and chastised Brooke for his lack of relevance. She said she and her classmates were searching for more immediate, ecstatic, and penetrating modes of living. Hillary got a standing ovation from her classmates, a cold shoulder from some parents, and a write-up in Life magazine. Hillary would be heading to Yale Law School with her political transition well underway. Do it! Do it! During Hillary's first year at Yale Law School, New Haven, like campuses across the country, was a center of student protest. Hillary never became a radical, as in college, she sought social change by working within the system. She organized fellow student marshals to monitor the crowds to prevent riots. That year, she also got involved in the women's movement as a student representative to the League of Women Voters. But amidst the tumultuous changes in American society, the biggest change in Hillary's life would occur the following year, and not on New Haven Green. The very first impression I had of him was I was walking through the student lounge area where the coke machines are at, at Yale and uh, I heard this voice off to my left and it was saying and not only that we grow the biggest watermelons in the world and I said to the friend I was with who is that and they said that's Bill Clinton and he's from Arkansas and that's all he ever talks about soon after that they were both in the law library where as with her first date Rick Ricketts Hillary made the first move he was standing in the um, hallway outside the law library at Yale, which is this wonderful Gothic structure. And he was surrounded by all of these fellow classmates who were trying to convince him to be on the Yale Law Journal. I said, look, I'm going home to Arkansas, and I don't, I'm not going to get a big Wall Street job. I'm not going to go clerk on the Supreme Court. I'm going home, be a country lawyer. I don't know if I want to be on the Law Journal. And he was listening politely, but he was watching me because I was watching him because I was in the law library at this long table studying. And I finally thought this is, you know, kind of silly. And finally, she just put down the book she was reading and walked the entire length of the law library and walked up to me and she said, If you're going to keep looking at me and I'm going to keep looking back, we at least ought to know each other. And I'm Hillary Rodham. And what's your name? Well, I couldn't remember my name. In 1972, George McGovern set out to unseat presidential incumbent Richard Nixon. Bill and Hillary had already been living together. That summer, they began their political work together. Gary Hart assigned Bill to coordinate McGovern's Texas campaign. Hillary went with him to Austin to register Hispanic voters. Fellow volunteer Betsy Wright became a lifelong friend. And I just remember her showing up in the headquarters one day to see Bill Clinton, and I thought she was just coordinating. Uh, pretty soon it became clear to me that this was a lot of very personal coordinating, too. After the campaign, the couple returned to Yale Law School. Bill had spent two years in England as a Rhodes Scholar before going to Yale, so he still had another year. While he studied, Hillary began to focus on what would become her legal specialty, the rights of children working at the Yale Child Study Center. It had been obvious to Betsy Wright even the summer before that this was one of Hillary's passions. We talked about what we as women were going to be able to do to make people's lives better and the kind of concern she had for women uh, bringing children up in poverty and not having a way out of it. In June of 1973, Bill returned to Arkansas after they both graduated. Hillary did not follow. She went to Washington, where activist Marion Wright Edelman hired her to help build the Children's Defense Fund. 
Hillary came as an early voice to that, came to us before we were in any way known as a young student um, right out of law school. Um, and she has had a passion about children and family and the poor and about education for all the time that I've known her. Then came Watergate, and the nation was riveted by the news of a break-in at the Democratic National Committee headquarters by aides to President Richard Nixon. When it was suggested that the president was involved in a cover-up, the question of impeachment arose. It would be an extraordinary opportunity for Hillary. John Doerr, special counsel to the House Judiciary Committee, handpicked 43 of the brightest young lawyers for his investigation. Hillary was one of only three women lawyers he selected. For the next eight months, she researched impeachment procedures and sat in on proceedings. There are tearful goodbyes now at the helicopter because Julie Nixon Eisenhower... On August 9, 1974, the impeachment inquiry ended. President Nixon had resigned. Hillary, like many of her colleagues, was offered a high-powered job with one of the nation's top law firms. Bill was still down in Arkansas. She had to decide what she really wanted to do. I didn't uh, think that Hillary would move to Arkansas with Bill. Um, but an awful lot of that was because it became clear to me Hillary was a future national leader in this country. In 1974, Hillary decided she'd try Arkansas, but only for a year. She took the bar and signed on at the State University in Fayetteville, teaching criminal law. Bill was a professor there and already campaigning for Congress. At the end of that first year, Bill had lost his congressional bid, but was clearly interested in running again for public office. Hillary, however, had still not made up her mind about moving to Arkansas permanently. So she went home to visit her parents and think things over. When she returned, Bill had a surprise for her. And I picked her up at the airport and I drove her back and I said, you know, I bought that house you liked. She said, what? I said, that house you like, I bought it. So you better marry me because I can't live in this big house by myself. She said yes. It was a beautiful house, a little brick house. And uh, the wedding was very small with a couple of her personal friends, and we enjoyed it very much. As I said, it was the spur of the moment. We've decided we can do it. And she'd gone out the day before and bought her dress with her mom. I was crushed. Not because I wasn't happy for them, and I guess I should have been able to see the inevitable, but it really meant that Hillary wasn't just having a good time on a temporary adventure in Arkansas. It really meant that my dreams for her to run for office for president or United States senator weren't going to happen. I mean, as, as much as she had accomplished in her own right and fought to bring her status up to a, a, a fine professional level, I think her heart got in the way a little bit on this one. And I'm glad it did. It was November 1976 that Bill Clinton won his first campaign. He was elected state attorney general, and the couple moved to Little Rock. Broad range of responsibilities for fighting crime and improving the criminal justice system. But Hillary chose to be more than a politician's wife. She pursued her legal career with the small but elite Rose Law Firm, becoming the first woman attorney in a firm known as the oldest west of the Mississippi. To avoid being judged by her husband's merits, Hillary kept her maiden name, Rodham. And her position at Rose allowed her to continue her child advocacy. She got a neonatal unit put into the Arkansas Children's Hospital. She established the uh, Arkansas Advocates for Family and Children. She was a national leader in the uh, Children's Defense Fund. While Hillary and Bill started out making the same salary, Hillary's earnings quickly surpassed her husband's. She made enough to risk $1,000 in the volatile commodities market, turning it into $100,000 in just two years. It was also during this period that the Clintons and friends James and Susan McDougall invested in a real estate venture called Whitewater. And in 1978, Bill ran yet another campaign. We have another projection to make at this point. Uh, in the race for governor in the state of Arkansas, the Democratic candidate who is presently the Attorney General, Bill Clinton, who, by the way, is 32 years old, according to ABC News Key Precincts, will be the next governor 
of the great state of Arkansas. He will be the youngest governor in 40 years. This is a victory for the future of Arkansas. Hillary was 31 when the Clintons became the first family of Arkansas, January 10th, 1979. I, Bill Clinton, do solemnly swear. In the next year, she made partner at Rowe's law firm and gave birth to their daughter. Chelsea was breached, and then she ended up being a C-section. It was kind of a surprise. She was working, you know, through all of this. But um, delivery was fine, and then she was okay. She was, and they just, you know, Bill couldn't get enough of this little face. Some say the Clintons were distracted by the birth of their baby. Some say Bill had just gotten too big for his britches. But after his first term as governor, Bill lost his re-election bid in November 1980. We are still awaiting a spokesman for the White campaign. And I... Mary Steenburgen, a friend of the Clintons, grew up in Arkansas. I think that most people um, that voted against him said that here's a little sort of slap on their on the wrist, you young guy. You better run a traditional campaign next time and get out there and you know press the flesh. Some blamed Bill's loss on Hillary. She was certainly unconventional by Arkansas standards. John Brummett covered the Clintons for the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. She used her maiden name. She did not uh, devote a great deal of attention to her uh, appearance. She wore thick glasses. She was not dressed in a particularly stylish way and didn't seem to care about it. The big event in Arkansas was a Razorback football game. Clinton would go and sit in a very public place on the 50-yard line, front row, a uh, uh, front row box seat. Hillary would sit there by him. Clinton standing up, cheering every play. She's reading a book at a Razorback football game. Yeah. Then he got beat, and then she comes back, and somebody's uh, given her a lot of advice about her makeup. Her hair is different. Uh, I made uh, I made what some thought was a sexist observation in a column. I said it looks like she's been away at cheerleader camp for a couple of years. When Bill announced his candidacy for the 1982 governor's race, Hillary was not only sporting a new look, but a new last name, Clinton. Bill crisscrossed the state campaigning after his 1980 loss, and Hillary's new last name, Clinton, and her more conventional appearance seemed to have pleased Arkansas voters. Bill Clinton won the 82 election handily. While I cannot, with complete Confidence claim victory tonight. It appears that we have won. And they would continue winning for the next 10 years. Bill would make Hillary the most powerful first lady Arkansas ever had, appointing her as the head of the Education Reform Commission. And I have decided to name my wife Hillary as chairman of that commission because I think she'll have more time uh, to consistently exercise the sort of leadership and direction the commission needs. Her skills were quickly apparent. The road to being somebody in this society starts with education. And we intend to be sure that everybody in this room and every child in this state is somebody. Because we're going to give them every chance we can to develop their minds so that they can play a role in this state and this country to make it the kind of place it needs to be. It was an exciting period for Hillary, a fine moment for the Clintons. But it didn't last long. In August 1984, Roger Clinton, the governor's younger half-brother, was arrested and convicted for selling cocaine. I love my brother very much, and I will try to be a comfort to him. But I want this case to be handled exactly as any other similar case would be. Nothing was worse than the pain that they experienced with first Roger's criminal legal problems but even more so the confronting the addiction. And Hillary was a major support of, of helping Bill keep those two different hats he wore separate during that period of time. Because the matter is now in court, I will have no further comment. Thank you very much. And it was at the same time that rumors began to circulate, suggesting that the governor was involved in extramarital affairs. There never been proof never been uh, much attention paid to it in the press but it has been a common source of discussion seemingly knowing discussion 
Her friend, Betsy Ebeling, was aware of the rumors when she visited the Clintons in Little Rock. It was not an easy time. She has a great deal of inner strength, and I think she turns to that. I don't know. Each of us has to answer our own questions. And some she lives with better than others. The couple had also thought of having another child, but it became clear that was not to be. It doesn't always work out that way. So I think she would have if it had happened, but it just didn't happen. They were very lucky to have the one they did. Chelsea, this is a pretty rock. I like this one. Which one? This pink one that you found. Oh. I think that's one of the prettiest ones you've ever found. Mom, what about if I picked up a golden one? The Clintons seem to have resolved their family and marital problems by the time Hillary's minister from Park Ridge visited them that year. They have admitted uh, having some troubles in their marriage. Actually, uh, I would also like to say that when I uh, observed that marriage in 1984, on the two long weekends in Little Rock, that was one of the most solid, loving marriages and families that I've seen in a long time. The personal and political problems did seem to help strengthen their relationship and train them to achieve under fire. In 1984, both Bill and Hillary were named the best of the new generation by Esquire magazine. Hillary was twice listed as one of the 100 most powerful lawyers by the National Law Journal. She was appointed to the boards of Walmart and TCBY Yogurt. And Bill was re-elected again and again. By 1991, it was clear they were on the road to even greater successes. Today, I proudly announce my candidacy for President of the United States of America. It was October 3rd. On the steps of the old state house in Little Rock, Bill Clinton entered a crowded field of Democratic candidates. One clear difference between him and his fellow presidential hopefuls would be his prominent campaign associate, Hillary. I'm also the only person running for president who can have my real campaign slogan. When you think of Hillary, think of our real slogan, buy one, get one free. <laughs> New Hampshire was the first primary, and every candidate worked the state zealously. In January, campaigning was at its peak. Paul Songus from neighboring Massachusetts was the favorite, but Bill Clinton was a strong contender. Until word of a yet-to-be-published story sold to a supermarket tabloid began to leak out, the story alleged an extramarital affair in the governor's past. As the Hillary met the charges head-on. And I have to tell you that, from my perspective, our marriage is a strong marriage. We love each other. We support each other. And we have had a lot of strong and uh, important uh, experiences together that have meant a lot to us. And in any marriage, there are issues that come up between two people who are married that I think are their business. It didn't work. When the story came out in print, this other woman from Arkansas stole the spotlight. Her name is Jennifer Flowers, and this is a picture of her taken a few years ago. Flowers says in the article that she was involved with the governor for 12 years, from 1977 to 1989. Bill's shot at the presidency was riding on whether the Clintons could defuse this now nationally broadcast allegation. At the end of January 1992, the Clintons' presidential campaign was foundering. Hillary and Bill decided to take an enormous risk and respond to Jennifer Flowers' allegations of an extramarital affair with the governor on national television. On Super Bowl Sunday, with the game's enormous audience still tuned in, this relatively unknown couple defended their marriage on CBS's 60 Minutes. I'm not sitting here, some little woman standing by my man like Tammy Wynette. Because of her candor and spirited defense of Bill, Hillary was credited with rescuing him. That appearance established that she was not a victim. And I think once she was not a victim uh, as a result of any of Bill's behavior, then we were able to move on. Bill came in a comfortable second in New Hampshire, and the Clinton campaign turned its attention to the rich prize of 11 state contests on Super Tuesday. 
On March 10th in Chicago, as the results came in, the magnitude of the victory became clear. They picked up 432 delegates. That night, as she often did, Hillary preceded Bill on the podium. Day. No one, I was just told, has ever gotten more delegates on a single day to win the Democratic nomination. Hillary's high profile in the campaign would make her as much a target of political mudslinging as any candidate. Fellow Democratic hopeful Jerry Brown charged the Clintons with funneling business to Hillary's Arkansas law firm. Bill defended his wife. But you ought to be ashamed of yourself for jumping on my wife. You're not worth being on the same platform I'll tell you wife. something, Mr. Clinton. Now, Don't try to escape it. Ralph Nader I called me this afternoon. He read me the article from the Washington Post. Does that make it I was shocked by it. The next day, Hillary responded to Brown's attacks. I suppose I could have stayed home and baked cookies and had teas, but I, what I decided to do was to fulfill my profession, which I entered before my husband was in public life. As with past attacks, Brown's accusations did not foil their campaign. They would keep winning all the way to Madison Square Garden, July 16th, 1992. I proudly accept your nomination for President of the United States. At the Democratic National Convention, Bill paid tribute to his father, his mother, and then... I learned a lot from another person, too. A person who for more than 20 years has worked hard to help our children, paying the price of time to make sure our schools don't fail them, doing it all while building a distinguished legal career and being a wonderful, loving mother. That person is my wife. A month later, at the Republican convention, it was clear that Hillary's non-traditional role made her an easy target for the GOP, whose convention touchstone was family values. Believing Mrs. Clinton made her husband vulnerable, the Republicans not only featured their own wives, but bashed Mr. Clinton's as well. Elect me, and you get two for the price of one, Mr. Clinton says, of his lawyer spouse. Hillary has compared marriage and the family as institutions to slavery and life on an Indian reservation. Well, speak for yourself, Hillary. During the fall campaign, Hillary's high profile was toned down. And despite her comment she was no Tammy Wynette, she stayed by her husband's side right through the last day of campaigning, a marathon 10-city tour. I have nine cities to go, but remember on the last day of this great campaign to change America. How do you do it? It must be really fatigued. It's the last lap, man. <laughs> well, the voice is making remarkable uh, comebacks at every landing, yeah. you know, because it's, it's very shaky. But it's okay. He's going to be fine. It was dawn, election day. They'd campaigned around the clock. Now it was a matter of waiting. When night fell on Little Rock, a crowd gathered to await the results. We project that Bill Clinton is going to be the next president of the United States. We project it. It was late when Arkansas's native son and his family emerged from the old state house. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all join together in welcoming the next. For the next three months, Bill Clinton would make the transition from governor to president. Hillary was a key player in everything from picking cabinet members to setting policy. Then it was time to say goodbye and pack up the treasures accumulated through 12 years in the governor's mansion. You know, it's just really memories kind of flooding back, all the games we played, you know, in this room or in another room in the house over Christmas or holidays. It was a transition in many ways for Hillary. She was not just moving from one house to another, she was moving into a place in history. A year before, she had taken a brief trip with friends Connie Fales, Nancy Snyderman, and Mary Steenburgen. Mary was struck by this recollection. 
we would walk through the streets of San Francisco and she would say, wow, we're out of Arkansas and nobody looks at me. They're all looking at you. This is fantastic. And so I remember saying to her right after Bill was elected president, I reminded her about what she said in San Francisco and I said that will never ever be true again. And it's, it's true. She'll never have anonymity again. <laughs> On that bright January day in 1993, President and Mrs. Clinton became the youngest first family since the Kennedys to enter the White House. With them would come changes, changes born of a generation. Today, a generation raised in the shadows of the Cold War assumes new responsibilities. It was Hillary who would be the most visible difference. The president immediately appointed his wife to lead one of his most pressing domestic initiatives, health care reform. And Hillary was catapulted into a position unprecedented in American history. We want you to be able to choose your health plan. It has to be portable from job to job and across state lines. We want to ensure quality. We do have to control costs. How could it be that everyone doesn't share your concerns because your love for your children and your family is what we say we believe in in our country. What makes Hillary Clinton such an unusual figure is she has different kinds of power. She has the power of a key White House policymaker. She has the power of a political confidant who's a relative, like Robert Kennedy, and she has the derivative power of being married to the President of the United States. You put those three roles together, you are talking about an extremely powerful person who, who was in the White House with no title, but with clout that is almost unequaled in, in any other administration I can think of. Many First Ladies have been independent, intelligent women who strongly influenced their husbands. But Hillary's role raised a political question. Since she was not subject to the checks and balances of a salaried government official, to whom was she accountable? She should be given a job with a salary, even if it's only a dollar a year, and uh, subject to uh, uh, being called Congress, interviewed by the press, and uh, be treated just like another senior official. Her power was such that Hillary's private life was subjected to withering public scrutiny treatment Washington usually reserves for its top officials. Questions arose about whether she had been given preferential treatment in the commodities trade she made during the 70s, and whether she and Bill had been given financial favors through their Whitewater real estate deal. What does this say about the Clinton presidency? I think I it mean, says a we, great deal about the ethics of the people involved in the Clinton presidency. We're talking about yeah. maybe some sloppy lawyerly work here that may embarrass Hillary oh, Clinton. I think we can be talking and about serious conflict of interest and serious misconduct. In the landscape of political scandals, Whitewater may be a bump, but it speaks mountains about me generation public ethics as well as single party control of certain states in the United States Congress. In a nutshell, Whitewater is about the arrogance of power. It would be months before the First Lady would recognize that she had to deal with matters she considered private in public. It is said in this town repeatedly, and has been printed, as you know, repeatedly, that Mrs. Clinton has dragged her feet every step of the way on trying to come clean on Whitewater, and people are wondering what's going on there. I think if you look back to the summer of 1992, you knew from the very beginning of this campaign from the very beginning on this road to the presidency that people were going to try to make Mrs. Clinton a political issue. They don't like the fact that she is involved in important issues like health care. They don't like the fact that she is unapologetic about the role she plays in the administration. While the news media focused on Whitewater, Hillary continued to focus on what she saw as her mission, reforming America's health care system, taking time off only for personal tragedies. The president's mother died of breast cancer. Vince Foster, a close friend of Hillary's from the Rose Law Firm and Deputy White House Counsel, committed suicide. And the most personal loss, Hillary's father, the man whose tough love had taught Hillary to withstand criticism. But for her family, the constant public criticism was difficult. When my father passed away, I got to spend some very special time with my sister. 
And for that week, my mother and I had her back. It's very hard sometimes because you see somebody you've known all your life and you see them in person, you see them on television, it's very difficult because you know who they are and you just feel like screaming at the top of your lungs this is a good person Hillary endured her friend said by leaning on lessons from her upbringing in Park Ridge and from both her parents they gave her wings but they also gave her a great deal of grounding in in things that were important her church her feelings her readings her parents' influence was clear when she finally spoke out on Whitewater. And I think if my father and mother said anything to me more than a million times, it was, don't listen to what other people say. Don't be guided by other people's opinions. You know, you have to live with yourself. And I think that's good advice. I mean, I'm glad I got it as a girl growing up, and I've passed it on to my daughter. But I do think that that advice and my belief in it combined with my sense of privacy because I do feel like I've always been a fairly private person leading a public life um, led me to perhaps be less understanding than I needed to of both the press and the public's um, interest as well as right to know things about uh, my husband and me. Well I've spoke to a lot of young women particularly uh, I don't know, lately around 13, 14, 15 year old uh, girls who have said that she's their hero and that they're, that they look at her and they feel like she's a good mom, you know, she's a good friend to her husband and she's an amazing friend to this country in terms of the work she's trying to do. And I think that, I think she's a wonderful role model for people. The people who like Hillary Rodham Clinton find in her a uh, not just a role model, but the kind of the chalice in which they poured all of their hopes that now uh, women have real power. Hooray. Her foes put in the chalice everything they dislike about the 60s, about the women's movement, about uh, stepping out of traditional roles, denigrating traditional uh, roles. In the most complimentary way, Hillary has not changed at all. She is, she's exactly as forthright. She's exactly as, as honest. She is just as, just as brilliant and just as interesting a person now as she was when she was a little kid. A Goldwater girl from conservative Park Ridge turned feminist, a loyal wife and a shrewd political partner a protective mother and a successful lawyer. Hillary Rodham Clinton was all of these. In her conspicuous position as First Lady, she embodied the turmoil evoked as women emerged from traditional roles at the end of this century and changed the rules for the next. She followed through on the, uh, on the promise of uh, that student revolution. And the promise was to change the world and make it better. Hence her anti-establishment speech at her commencement. And it was about a new future and about a new world. Um, and she still talks that way. Hold on to your dreams, whatever they are. Take up the challenge of forging an identity that transcends yourself. Transcend yourself and you will find yourself. Care about something that you needn't bother with at all? Throw yourself into the world and make your voice count. When the Clintons first arrived at the White House, there was a problem. The staff didn't know what to call the president's wife. Should they refer to her as Mrs. Clinton? No, too sexist. Ms. Clinton, 270s. Mrs. Rodham Clinton, too long. The solution was simple, informal, and indicative of the changes this exceptional woman has made to the role of First Lady. They call her...
Hillary.